this is Mr. Hammond Beyer again with Lecture 10, Part 2, The Gene Green Revolutions and the Next Generation of Food. Okay, so um, uh, industrial food production and high input monoculture accounts for about 80% of the world's food. Um, it uses large amounts of fossil fuel energy, fertilizers, pesticides, greenhouse gases are produced, and um, it has fed the world for the last 60 or 70 years, but it is not necessarily environmentally sustainable. So how did we get to this point? You have to go back a bit to what was the um, Dr. Borland and the Green Revolution. And there are three basic strands, the biochemical, the mechanical, and the social strand. Um, first off, they hybridized seeds and they introduced lots of fertilizers and herbicides and pesticides which increased yields and controlled the weed population, controlled the pest population, which therefore increased production. The mechanical side of it, diesel pumps and electrical pumps were used for irrigation in deep wells which drew water out of the aquifers and um, uh, mechanization of farming, John Deere and other um, tractor companies developed really well expensive but very specific tractors to help implement all of this other technology which then increased productivity significantly. It reduced the labor so it's not nearly as labor in intensive as it farming once was um, increased productivity, increased speed, allowed people to use all of the arable land, which therefore gave us more food. All right, and then the third component of it was the social aspect. So land reform, legislation, banking um, constraints were changed so that there was more money available to farmers so they could purchase more expensive equipment and expensive seeds and make more profit. Okay, Norman Bolag and the Green Revolution, take a few minutes and go, while you're on the um, PowerPoint, and go to these um, websites. You'll notice this YouTube video talks about how Dr. Borlag introduced this process into Mexico and what happened to their productivity. The rebuttal from um, Dr. Shiva in India is, gives paints a slightly different picture. She's not nearly as pro that. And then certainly the um, Copenhagen, Copenhagen video um, gives you yet a third perspective. But what do the facts say? Here's what's happened. Back in 1950, we were getting about 700 kilograms per hectare of wheat. Versus in 2004, we had tripled that, more than tripled that, to closer to 27, almost quadrupled it, 2,700 kilograms of wheat per hectare. So now we have increased our productivity and our yields, so there's more food available. Well, also, there were more humans on the planet. 1950, well, by, by the end of 1990s, we reached six billion human beings on the planet, and down here we were at about two and a half billion. So our population has increased significantly. Now in those countries that took on the Green Revolution, for example Mexico, look at what's happened to their yield of wheat in kilograms per hectare versus some countries who partially accepted it, partially rejected it. In India and Pakistan, their yields have gone up, but not nearly as significantly as in Mexico. So what really has happened worldwide? Notice that the green um, revolution and grain production overall has increased significantly um, from the 1960s to 2010. But if we look at it per capita, so it increased rapidly per capita in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. But then, as we got into the 2000s, it has definitely leveled off. So we're no longer producing more and more food per person. Okay. Um, what aided this rapid increase here was the development of dwarf plants. So if you grow wheat and it's a very tall grass, 
Well, if it's really tall and you have a big fruiting body at the end with all the seeds on it and the wind comes along or a storm comes along and blows it and it breaks and the plant dies, um, you decrease your productivity. So they've developed shorter plants which can still have the big fruiting bodies and therefore have high productivity and not susceptible to storms and winds, wind um, options. Okay. What this has done in the long run, yes, we've made more food, but it has had a greater harmful environmental effect than any other human activity. Now, you need some evidence to support that particular statement. Um, there's also been a loss of a variety of genetically different crop materials. And in the United States, 97% of the food plant varieties available in 1940 are no longer available. We have hybridized and hybridized and hybridized our food so that the, the best producing wheat, the best producing corn, the best producing rice strains are what are available commercially. Now, to support that first statement, why is industrial agriculture such a bad thing for the environment? Well, we've lost biodiversity, certainly. We have... Um, uh, degraded our grasslands, we have cut down forests in order to make more cr um, croplands, we've even uh, taken wetlands and turned them into croplands. Okay. Part of the problem from that is when we apply pesticides and herbicides, they drain into local water sources which cause fish kills um, from the pesticide runoff. Okay. Soil erosion we talked about in the last piece of this lecture, so we've lost fertility, we've had salinization problems, um, and desertification. In terms of water, well now we have all of this water waste because we're irrigating the heck out of our fields, where's that water going? And it's picking up um, these pesticides and herbicides. The ground is not particularly cleaning it as well as it could. Um, uh, so we have sediment pollution from erosion, we have fish kills as mentioned before, and we have surface and groundwater pollution from the pesticides and fertilizers. Which, from the fertilizer side of it, has caused eutrophication of many lakes. And if you remember back when we talked about the aging of lakes, well, nitrates and phosphate fertilizers are the things that age lakes the most, causing eutrophication. And in many parts of the world, lakes are becoming eutrophic because of fertilizer runoff. Air pollution has also increased because greenhouse gases from running diesels and from spraying um, from fossil fuel use and then uh, um, the pesticides also produce aerosols which then make nitrous oxide which is um, uh, another form of air pollution. And then in Illinois, when I worked in Illinois, we had always to test the water for um, nitrates because young children and pregnant women who drink high levels of um, nitrates in the water can have cyanosis. So they cause some real problems in, in especially infants. Um, so the water has to be tested there where there's a lot of fertilizer going into the, into the groundwater. Okay, so we increased our productivity, we fed the world, everything was great, but the population keeps on going up. So we needed to bring in phase two. And phase two is the gene revolution, where historically we have um, hybridized or crossbred plants to get, starting all the way back with Mendel's experiments with the peas um, back in the 1840s, getting the best type of crop that we could. Now we have jumped to genetically modifying or genetically engineering um, uh, crops to get exactly the traits we want and we can bring in traits from other crops or other animals or plants that specifically we want. Um, for example, let's say that you're growing in a rather arid place so you don't want to grow beans that use the normal amount of water. You can use beans that are much more drought tolerant because they've been genetically modified. Another example of this is Bt corn. So there's a bacteria, Bacillus thuringiens, which um, produces a toxin that kills bugs. If we take the DNA out of that, 
bacteria, that bacillus, and put it into corn, the corn will now produce that toxin, which will kill the mealworms. So if you've ever opened up an ear of corn and found little grubs or worms growing, chewing away at it, farmers don't want that to happen. The consumer doesn't necessarily want that to happen. So if we genetically modify the corn, that will kill those guys and it won't be an issue. There are some problems with this in the long run. And, um, and what happens um, when we transplant DNA from one animal or organism into another organism? Here's a good example of that. Of what's called the winged bean is a genetically modified food that can grow especially in the tropics. And it's high in nutrition. It grows under stress or under low water conditions. And it produces a very um, thick and abundant crop. So in this case, you've taken something and made it better. Is that any different than hybridizing the way we did in the past, cross-pollinating plants in the past? OK, there has been a lot of controversy with the gene revolution. Um, critics fear that we don't know enough about the long-term potential. Now you're putting out pieces of fragments of DNA into the environment. What's going to happen to them? How are they going to affect other organisms? Um, and also there's been a real issue about who owns that crop. So Monsanto is notorious at this. They have developed the BT corn. And there was an example in uh, Washington State where a farmer was an organic, certified organic farmer, and the next farmer up purchased BT corn. The organic farmer did not buy any corn, and so at the end of the season, somebody, he, some of his corn got tested, and Monsanto brought a lawsuit against him because he had the BT gene in his corn. Well, he didn't do that. The wind cross-pollinated, took some of the pollen from the farmer who had bought the BT corn and it blew into his field. Well, that now ruined his organic certification and Monsanto sued him for stealing some seeds. So there are some pitfalls to this process. Okay, what I posted on Tuesday and here's your task. Now you know a little bit about gene and green revolution. Um, find at least three common food items that have been genetically modified and prepare a concise three-paragraph essay on this topic. In paragraph number one, name these three foods and how they've been modified and what's the advantage of the modification. Paragraph number two, list the key po points of the argument against um, GMOs, genetically modified foods. Make sure that you use APA format, gives credit to your sources. And then in paragraph three, take a stand. Are you for genetic modification or not? It doesn't matter which stand you take, but defend it, okay? And defend it with um, at least two articles of some kind of scientific merit. That's due a week from today. Okay, now, here's the big question. How many human beings can the world support given our food production and um, relative to the population. You know, we're almost at 8 billion human beings. Can we make enough food to feed all those people? And um, uh, that, the answer to that question depends upon how much um, uh, consumption of meats are in their diet. So those living at very low on the, on the socioeconomic status and those very high have a shorter lifespan than those people living in the middle. What does that really mean? Well, let's think about um, beef. To raise one kilogram of cow requires seven kilograms of grain. So for every human being who's eating a kilogram of, of cow, you know that that's taking seven kilograms of wheat or corn or soybeans out of human consumption. Versus pigs, it's 4 to 1. Um, chickens are 2.2 to 1, and catfish or carp are at about 2 to 1. So this would argue eating lower on this relative food chain. So it takes a lot less energy to raise fish or chicken than it does to raise beef. So, to go back to the question, how many humans can the world support? 
Well, it depends on how many people really think that a steak is the right thing to have for dinner every night. If we look at using that argument, you know, we want to eat more, push people towards high protein items like fish. Well, look at what's happened to the catch over time from the 1950s, about 20 a million metric tons of fish were um, caught and by 2000 we were at nearly 130 million metric tons of, of fish that was caught including aquaculture and but look at the per capita so initially in the 50s and 60s the catch per capita um, went way up but now that the population has gotten higher the catch per capita is not as great as it was How much fish do humans around the globe eat? Well, in 1960s, we were eating about 8 or 9 kilograms per, of fish per year. Now we're eating, uh, well, in 2011, we were closer to 19 kilograms per person per year. So we are eating a lot more fish as a viable source of protein, which leads to how long can we sustain that? There's more and more people on the planet and we're eating more fish. And where is that fish coming from? Well, if we're pulling it out of the ocean, how long can the ocean continue to support humans' need for more fish? And part of the problem comes from, in the global fishing industry, there are about $25 billion per year. It costs $25 billion per year more to catch the fish than the fish is worth. Which means, are we not paying enough for fish? Or is it because there are government subsidies? Well, there are government subsidies, and without those, most fisheries would, and fishing fleets would probably collapse. Which means we eat more meat, we'd eat more beef and pork. Is that necessarily a good thing? Okay. So aquaculture has become um, more and more common and prevalent and more popular. And what is aquaculture? Raising large numbers of fish in a contained area um, uh, that can either be in pens in the ocean or it can be in ponds or tanks in Louisiana. They raise catfish and they raise crayfish um, in ponds quite, quite successfully. Fish ranching involves um, uh, getting the eggs and milk from uh, fish that have run back into the ocean, raising up the fingerlings, then releasing them out into the ocean, letting them grow up, come back, and collecting them when they come back. Okay. All right, so notice since the 1990s how much aquaculture production has really increased. And there are some, you know, so that's taking less pressure, or it's taking pressure off of the fishing fleets, but there are some issues with it. Okay, so yes, you have a high efficiency and a high yield and a relatively small volume of water, but you need lots and lots of food for those fish, and where do those wastes go? Those wastes, if you're out, if you're in a big cage in the ocean, all of that waste and the food that doesn't get eaten drops to the bottom and causes basically a, an anaerobic death zone below the cage. That's not necessarily productive. Um, it does have low fuel usage, um, but... The fish are very vulnerable to disease, diseases. When you have all these fish in a cage, if one fish gets sick or if wild populations come by and they're, they're carrying a disease and it jumps into the cage, all those fish are very susceptible. Okay. Um, uh, okay. So there are some solutions for this aquaculture thing. Uh, and part of the problem was some Atlantic salmon were found in the Pacific Ocean. And how did Atlantic salmon get in the Pacific Ocean? because they escaped aquaculture pens out there and now they didn't know where to go. They had no native streams to spawn in. They were now competing with the wild Pacific salmon. That's not the best. Um, and then the other side is if you're raising Pacific salmon in the Pacific Ocean and some of them escape, now you're mixing the genetics of the of the stockfish with the wild population, what does that do to the purity of the strain of the wild um, Chinook or Coho or um, King Salmon? Okay. okay, so let me propose the next generation. 
This is something you can do in your own backyard. And the next generation is really aquaponics. Rather than raising fish and feeding the fish um, uh, all of their food and then that waste just being dispersed into the environment, let's use it somehow. So in this case, uh, here at Davidson, we have a bunch of goldfish in a tank and the fish are fed and their wastes are then pumped up to um, some beds that are full of lettuce and tomatoes and depending on the season, Swiss chard uh, or bok choy and the plants absorb the waste from the fish and return clean water back to the fish tank. So we are in fact using their waste as fertilizer. You can do this on, this is only a two, 300 gallon tank um, with a really small pump uh, pumping, you know, a, a maybe 10 gallons an hour. So it's not a high volume pump. It just flows it through, but it pulls enough of the nitrogen out so that we can contain, we're growing probably, we're growing about 100 goldfish in this tank at this point in time, anywhere from uh, 4 inches to about 15 inches. Okay. There is a video on your PowerPoint about fish heads. They are doing this on a large scale out in Sardis, Georgia, just south of Augusta. Um, and if you have more interest, let me know and you can come visit Davidson and I'll show you how we're doing it here. The other aspect of this is can we make our global food security more local? Can we, in fact, have urban gardens that are going to um, raise more of the food, therefore you don't have the transportation cost of getting it from Iowa all the way to New York City, or, um, and you have it right in your backyard, you have much more control about it, of it. Okay. The other side of this is a lot of the food is wasted because it has so far to go and we don't necessarily do well with it. Okay, Pam Warhurst has a TED Talk that's also a link in the video. Please take a look at that. She argues that every city street especially where there are boulevards, and in Aiken, you know, there are all kinds of boulevards. Why don't we plant all kinds of vegetables in those spaces? Why can't we just walk down the street and pick a tomato that's growing on the side of the, of the road? Why not? Why make it pretty pansies? Why not make it something that's effective? Okay. That's what I have to say for today.